I want to tell you a story. So it was August 2011, and I was in London, and I was at a pub that looks a lot like this one, having a drink with a friend. And this guy comes up to me and says, do you want to buy some Charlie? Now, I didn't know what Charlie was, but it sounded very, very bad. <laughs> so I said, no Charlie for me. Be gone with you. I will have no Charlie. And then I wondered, why had I acted out in this preposterous and sort of theatrical way? And then I looked across the street, and I saw there was a huge pole, and mounted on it was a surveillance camera that was planted right at me. And what I realized is that I was acting out my innocence for the camera. Now, in the wake of the urban spring, when Baltimore and North Carolina and cities across America have been inflamed with police injustice. Lots of African-American young men have described the same experience of acting out their innocence to the police, of feeling that they're guilty until they prove their innocence. And the phenomenon that they experienced is now being experienced by citizens of every background across America as technologies of ubiquitous surveillance are threatening not only values of privacy, but also equal justice under law. And what I want to do this morning is talk with you about four of these technologies and what we can do about them. And those are ubiquitous surveillance in public, DNA surveillance, brain scans, and targeted advertising. Let's start with ubiquitous surveillance in public. Imagine that it's, uh, I don't know, next year, and President Obama goes on TV and says, citizens, to protect the people of America, we are going to fly drones across the land. And these will surveil you, and they will be able to identify wrongdoing. So if these drones were mounted, and you know they're really not that much bigger than the ones in the picture, then they could fix on anyone, say me, follow me forward. If the pictures were backward, they could uh, archive, they could follow me backward. If the pictures were live streamed on Google, then anyone could follow anyone else 24-7. And you would basically have the possibility of reconstructing anyone's movements 24-7 for all time. Now imagine that the president did this for our safety. Would this violate the Fourth Amendment? That's the one that protects the right of the people to be secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, at the time of the American Revolution, the framers of the Fourth Amendment had one case in particular in mind when they drafted those beautiful words, and that was the case of John Wilkes. I want to tell you about him because this is the key to what the Fourth Amendment originally meant. John Wilkes was a British dissenter. He wrote a series of anonymous pamphlets criticizing uh, Lord Bute, who was the foreign secretary, of having an affair with King George III's mother. So obviously the king was not amused. And he instructed his henchman, Lord Halifax, to identify the author of this anonymous pamphlet. It was called North Britain 45. And armed with this warrant, which didn't specify the place to be searched or the thing to be seized, but basically just said, find the guy who wrote this pamphlet, the king's agents broke into lots of innocent people's houses, riffled through their private papers and diaries, and eventually identified Wilkes as the author of North Britain 45. Well, he was indicted for seditious libel. That means criticizing the king. And he sued in trespass. He said, there was no valid warrant that particularly specified me as a suspicious person, therefore my conviction for seditious libel should not stand. And a jury agreed and gave him a thousand pounds. That's a kind of McDonald's coffee-like verdict of 1763. <laughs> and this case was so galvanizing to the American colonists that first of all, they had beer parties where they would drink 45 steins of beer to celebrate this case. And then they named towns and children from Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania to John Wilkes Booth in Wilkes's honor. Well, the case of John Wilkes is so significant that uh, John Adams said of a related case uh, involving the general warrants, at that moment, the child independence was born. And Chief Justice John Roberts invoked this inspiring story in a really important and inspiring opinion recently, where all nine justices of the US Supreme Court held that the police, when they arrest someone, 
cannot search our cell phones without a warrant. In other cases, the court has held that generally when you're arrested, the cops can pat you down and open up any closed container on your body, like a cigarette packet. But Chief Justice Roberts, telling the story of the general warrant, said, a cell phone is not like a cigarette packet. This contains all of our most intimate hopes and fears, the records of the people we associate with and the movements that we make in public. For such an intimate and invasive search, a warrant is presumptively required. Well, there was another recent case involving technology in the Fourth Amendment involving global positioning system surveillance. This is a case where the cops put a GPS device on the bottom of a suspect's car and followed his movements 24-7 for a month. He objected that there was no valid warrant and therefore the search should fall. And in an important decision, all nine justices agreed that a search had occurred. But the majority opinion by Justice Antonin Scalia said, the problem was physical trespass. The cops had to walk in the guy's driveway when they put the GPS device on the bottom of his car, and they physically seized the car when they affixed the device. That's a good ruling as far as it goes, but it doesn't tell us anything about the constitutionality of those flying drones, because those drones, like our cell phones, can track our movements in public without physical trespass. We need to translate the Fourth Amendment in an age of new technologies so that it protects just the same amount of privacy in the 21st century as the framers took for granted in the 18th. And in order to engage in that important act of constitutional translation, I want to ask all of you to join me in a simple but resonant question. WWBD, what would Brandeis do? <laughs> Louis Brandeis is my hero. He was, I think, the greatest Supreme Court Justice of the 20th century. He served from 1916 to 1939, and he believed that it was important to translate the Constitution in light of new values. He dissented in an important case in 1928 involving wiretapping. A majority of the court said, no physical trespass when the cops put the taps on the sidewalks uh, leading up to the office of a suspected bootlegger. But Brandeis anticipated new technologies. He imagined a day when citizens would be able to look at each other through television screens. Basically, he anticipated Skype. And he said that it was important to forbid searches that could collect a tremendous amount of intimate information, like wiretapping, whether or not there was a physical trespass. All right, so guided by that, visionary insight, I want to talk to you about four technologies that are now transforming both privacy in public spaces and also equal justice under law. And those are surveillance in public, DNA surveillance, brain scans, and targeted advertising. Let's talk about surveillance in public. Uh, it was August 2011 during that trip uh, when the guy asked me to buy Charlie Actually, you know, I'm really glad I didn't buy the Charlie because I later found out that Charlie is cocaine. So do not buy Charlie, ladies and gentlemen. It's very, very bad. No Charlie for you. But I, I you know, I, I was sent actually to London. Uh, it was an exciting assignment by the New York Times Magazine to figure out why it was that London and England, the cradle of Magna Carta, which is turning 800 this year, has wired itself up with more surveillance cameras than any other country per capita in Europe. And I actually sat inside a control room that looked a little bit like the one that you're looking at. And it was midnight. And I sat there from midnight to 6 AM and watched the monitors as they used their joysticks in the digital city of Hull to engage in their surveillance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think a bunch of bored, unsupervised guys do <laughs> between midnight and 6 AM when they've got un regulated access to joysticks. First, they zoom in on attractive women. They were kind of ogling women and looking and engaging in voyeuristic surveillance. And then they zoomed in on minority young men, guys who looked different and literally were following them down the street. They were actually, before my eyes, engaging in racial profiling. That shows us the connection between invasions of privacy and invasions of equality. DNA surveillance teaches us the same lesson. It is proliferating, and the courts are beginning to confront it. Recently, in an important opinion, the US Supreme Court upheld the right of the cops, if you're arrested, or I'm arrested, to seize a DNA sample by taking a cheek swab of our DNA, you know, by the side of your car, 
and then taking that genetic information and storing it in a DNA database that can later be queried if there's a future crime. Just as Antonin Scalia, no liberal slouch, he dissented in that case. He wrote a wonderful dissent comparing the search of our genetic material, which can reveal so much about us, our predispositions to illness, for example, to the general warrants that sparked the American Revolution. And Scalia said our hardy forebears who forswore the general warrants would have been appalled by this royal intrusion into their mouths. It was a wonderful phrase. But he was in dissent. He was in dissent in that case. And DNA surveillance is proliferating in ways that are even more disturbing. Several states have begun something called familial searches. What are those? So there's a crime scene, and genetic material is found. The cops query the database, and they find that the person who committed the crime is not in the database. But a family member of that person is in the database. They're related enough that they can identify the family member. And then the cops go and identify the family members and try to track down the suspects. You're shaking your head, and you're right that this is troubling because it has huge implications for equality. African Americans uh, represent 13% of the US population, but about 40% of uh, people who are uh, in jail. So one scholar has estimated that as these familial searches proliferate, then you could have 17% of African American suspects identified by these familial searches, but only 4% of Caucasian suspects. That means that the police are literally zeroing in on suspects simply because a member of their family committed a crime. Now I want to talk to you about brain scans. This is another brave new world technology. Using fMRI imaging, uh, the cops can distinguish between your amygdala, which is the fight or flight impulse center of the brain, and the cerebral cortex, which is the conscience. And they're developing sort of sci-fi lie detection techniques. You could be stopped on the street, hooked up to a portable brain scan, and shown a picture of a training camp in Afghanistan. If you haven't been to the if training camp, your brain won't light up. Uh, if you have been, it will light up, and then you can be taken into a back room and bludgeoned or something like that. It's troubling. Wow, indeed. Well, that's only the beginning. Because these brain scans, in some cases, are being used by uh, criminals to argue, my brain made me do it. You know, I shouldn't be held accountable for a crime because I had a, a cyst uh, in my uh, cerebral cortex that made me unable to control myself. But more troublingly, we're beginning to see something called cognitive profiling, where the police, by taking scans of the brain, can decide that your gray matter suggests that you're especially likely to engage in violence in the future. People could be detained not based on their actions, but their thoughts. Not based on what they do, but their predispositions. In light of this technology, we need a whole new conception of cognitive liberty to protect the privacy of the mind and intellectual privacy, and to ensure that we have zones of immunity from the government peering into our most intimate thoughts. The final technology I want to talk to you about is targeted advertising. We're all familiar on the web with the experience of buying some cold play on one site and being bombarded by ads for it on another. But the dangers of targeted advertising are not just uh, annoyance. They implicate questions of economic justice. Increasingly, people are being put in different categories based on their perceived value to advertisers, and this is leading for people to pay different prices online based on the categories into which they've been placed. Did you know, for example, that if you are a Mac user, you are likely to pay 11% more for hotels that you shop on Orbitz than if you're a PC user? Time to get, stop shopping on Orbitz or else get a PC. But it definitely, <laughs> it, it definitely shows you that what we are increasingly, what is happening online is the same thing that is happening in the government. We're being placed in categories based on our perceived value to the government and based on whether or not the government thinks that we are uh, one kind of person. This is challenging our very ability to define ourselves who the government and advertisers say we are has become more important than who we believe that we actually are. Well, what can we do about this? These new technologies of profiling are threatening 
the legitimacy of law enforcement. In the wake of the urban spring, as cities across America were set on fire, all of the studies showed that people are most likely to obey the law when they trust the legitimacy of the police that are enforcing it. As this profiling and redlining and ubiquitous surveillance expands, mistrust of the police may increase along with an increase in violence. So what can we do about this? You see this incredible image of the young man fleeing innocently and that experience of losing any respect for law enforcement is something that will proliferate in light of these technologies. We can do uh, several things about this. Uh, we have to recognize, first of all, that these new technologies of surveillance do threaten privacy as well as equality. We have to reconstruct spheres of intellectual privacy and cognitive liberty, and we have to recognize that ubiquitous surveillance is akin to the general warrants that sparked the American Revolution. But most of all, we have to realize that we, you and I, have a responsibility for standing up for privacy and equality in a digital age. And to illustrate this, I want to end with this just incredible story of the choice between the naked machine and the blob machine. Many of you will remember, uh, right after 9-11 at airports, going through these really creepy uh, thermal uh, imaging through 3D body scanners uh, that were basically naked machines. They could show contraband or uh, anything that was under clothing, but they also showed really graphic images of the human body. At the same time, the government had been faced with a better technology, call it the blob machine. You can see it uh, as well. It shows a, a cuddly Pillsbury Doughboy figure. <laughs> Uh, which you just want to give a big hug to, along with uh, a, a place that indicates where you need secondary screening. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you would think that given a choice between the naked machine and the blob machine, this would be a no-brainer, because both of these machines pr promise exactly the same degree of security, but one threatens to immolate privacy while the other absolutely protects it. But that's not what happened. Given the choice between these two machines, in fact, the government in many cases chose the naked machine. And it took a political protest. The immortal words offered by that young man who should be immortalized as the Patrick Henry of the anti-body scanner movement. This was the guy who exclaimed at Thanksgiving a few years ago at the airport, don't touch my junk. <laughs> Those beautiful words <laughs> inspired citizens across America to rise up. and to demand their liberty. And the result of that protest, the result of that protest convinced the government to go back to the drawing board and they were shocked to discover, oh wait, they could in fact retrofit the naked machines as blob machines. Nowadays, at most airports, when you go through a body scanner, it will be a blob machine, not a naked machine. For most of us, ladies and gentlemen, that is an act of mercy. <laughs> so that is the moral of my story, ladies and gentlemen. Ultimately, the responsibility of protecting privacy in an age of new technologies and equal justice under law falls upon we, the people. The courts can't save us. Legislators can't save us. Technologists can't save us. The only people who can save us, ladies and gentlemen, is you. Thank you so much.